Hey, welcome back to the Axe Podcast. Uh, today I'm joined with Chad Thomas, who's one of our elders here at MCC. And Chad, I'm incredibly excited to have you here. But as they know, I'm a student pastor, so I have to have fun before I do anything serious. Sure, that makes And sense. so the question I have for you today to start us off is, would you rather eat pizza with only pineapples on it forever or pizza with only anchovies on it forever? Oh, man. Well, I was going to say thanks for having me, but uh, well, something <laughs> like that. <laughs> I'm not sure. That's, that's, that's a tough question for me because um, I don't like either of those things. Yeah. Um, but I will say if I had to eat that for the rest of my life, mm. I tend to go savory over sweet. And especially when it comes to pizza, I do not want sweet. Unless it's yeah. like a, one of those dessert or fruit pizzas where it's intended to be that way and okay. it's not like cream cheese or yeah. whatever. But if we're talking pizza, I would probably have to say anchovies. I haven't had them in years and years. So okay. it's possible my taste buds have changed. Uh, but I would probably rather deal with that than have to go with the pineapple. Although my wife would probably be upset with me because she loves Hawaiian pizza. So she loves the whole ham and pineapple thing. Yeah. I am not a fan. Uh, so at times we have to go two different routes when she's <laughs> in the mood for pizza. Uh, but yeah, I would probably oh, man, have to say anchovies. That pizza split down the middle where it's like half and half. Just It's never great. No, it can yeah. be a struggle. It's, Unless you're yeah. truly willing to commit to eating half and half. Then somebody has it left over or a flink. Right. I really wanted, you know, an extra piece because you were you weren't only going to eat like three or something like that. But yeah, yeah. I don't like throwing stuff away. Ever since I went to Haiti, I don't like throwing food away. So like, if I were <laughs> going to commit to eating that piece, I would feel bad. I would have to the, eat every single yes, piece. Yeah, throwing the pineapple away would be a problem for me. Oh man, I feel that. Uh, well, anyway, thanks for being on here and indulging my silliness uh, a little bit today. Uh, as before we dive into this important topic of the Holy Spirit today, I really wanted us to take a moment and pause and reflect on the fact that you're an elder here at MCC. And a lot of people maybe don't know what an elder is and what an elder does, because it's very much a behind the scene role. But I would, I would love it if you could explain to us just for a second, what is an elder at MCC and what do you do? Fair enough. And I appreciate you asking that because um, I've had that question asked of me in the since uh, you know, several years ago when, when I was, was asked, uh, tapped on the shoulder and, and, and put forward and ordained as an elder, what exactly does that mean and, and what does that look like? And obviously, as we're talking about Acts um, in this series, we see the, the concept of elders introduced in Acts. Uh, I, most notably, the one that stands out to me is in chapter 14, where we see Paul and Barnabas. It says they appointed elders in, in all of the churches uh, yeah. that they have founded. So, uh, understanding what that looks like and uh, trying to be kind of uh, biblically nerdy. I mm-hmm. looked up what the Greek word was that was being used there for elder, and it's uh, presbyteros, if I'm saying that correctly. I uh, did not go to Bible college or study Greek, but um, it basically refers to um, someone that was uh, appointed uh, for a, uh, an office or a task. And specifically when we talk about within the church, um, it is, and while there's, there's some hint there to just being uh, a man of, of age and experience and therefore assuming that there's, there's wisdom and life experience in that. Yeah. Um, it's also being called to be a leader within that church. And uh, other churches might use other denominations. You might hear it referred to as bishop. Um, some churches I know will refer to their, their elders as shepherds, mm. uh, which actually happen to resonate with that concept because um, in another part of, again, I think it's, it's Acts. Uh, but we are called to another reference as well as being an overseer, but saying overseers should be um, mindful and yeah. of the responsibility they take of shepherding the flock uh, to which they have been assigned, knowing that that's a calling for God. Mm. Um, from God on our lives. So what that looks like then in MCC, um, we operate off of what we call the four P's. So we have prayer, protection, pastoral care, and policy. Okay. And what those look like in a nutshell, a prayer should be relatively obvious, but when we come together, um, not only individually, but when we come together and meet, yeah. we pray for this church body and we pray for, for God's guidance. We pray for the leading of the Holy Spirit, as we will be talking about. Uh, we pray for continued wisdom. You know, the, the Bible says if we ask for wisdom, we will be given it. And so we we pray for that. And um, in doing so, then we're also praying over the requests that we see. And uh, we'll come in here sometimes and, you know, we're in our worship center, which you may not know, but we have our prayer boards on the wall praying over those things. So we take that seriously. And that uh, that ties in a little bit to pastoral care. But before I get to that, just going sequentially, besides leading in prayer, we also have protection. So mm-hmm. that, that concept is first and foremost, you know, we're protecting the, the doctrinal purity 
uh, within this church? Are we, are we following the guidelines yeah. um, that is set forth in, in God's word of what that looks like, who we should be as, as Christ followers, what we should look like as a church body that is committed to him? Um, and part of how we do that, too, is making sure that we are protecting our staff and the church body um, as as people and individuals. We want to make sure that we are looking out for our staff members, that we are keeping them healthy and whole, spiritually, emotionally, physically. Are we looking out for them and shepherding them appropriately? And the same for the, the church body. Mm. Um, are, we, are we looking out for their needs? Are we engaging with them and shepherding with them? And sometimes what that looks like between the two, um, there might be um, struggles or problems that come either direction, either from the staff to the yeah. church body or the leadership uh, as a whole, or uh, in the other way where we need to make sure is, is what's happening here according to God's will, mm. and do we need to step in and, and provide some kind of protection either way in that. Then as we move on, number three was pastoral care. Um, I think that's, that's probably a bit self-evident, but once again, just making sure that we're looking out for the, the needs of the church, yeah. uh, for all of those that are, that are gathered here and call MCC home. Um, are we looking out for them? Are we shepherding them? Are we um, making sure we know what's going on in their lives and the struggles if they share them with us? And uh, it ties into praying for them, to um, engaging with them. Uh, at times, we're asked to, to go visit them in the hospital or in yeah. their homes. Uh, so making sure that we're doing those things and just looking out for their well-being and, and loving on them as we're called to. And then finally, policy. Um, anything that, that goes on around here, especially for not just to be organizationally sound, uh, but knowing that any way that we operate, we want to have a policy in place for what that should look like here at MCC. Yeah. And while that also ties into the concept of, you know, are we uh, theologically sound? Are we doctrinally pure? Uh, which are common terms that are used. But are we making sure that those policies uh, align to who God has called us to be and how we should operate as a church body? Um, sometimes those those concepts come through the staff and they, they bring it to, to us through Mike and Rich and, and we will go through that and pray over it and have discussions on what that looks like. Uh, other times it may be something that we have recognized that is a need that we need to work on and institute. Yeah. Uh, and then we rely on Mike and Rich to make sure that uh, those are being followed and adhered to, uh, whether by staff or, or by the church. And so as, as we move to that then, so one of the... Um, the pieces that we do here, because as a, as elders, just in general, for anybody that doesn't know, but, um, you know, there, there are qualifications that are called out. So when anybody is called, hopefully, you know, we are, we are trying to gauge that they fall in line either with, um, qualifications that we see in first Timothy three or in Titus one. Uh, but at the end of the day, are we men of integrity, men of the word, men of, mm-hmm. uh, hopefully men of the, the spirit, uh, where you see fruitfulness in our lives. And we are seeking to, um, to honor all that God has and does, not just when we are here, but through every yeah. every day to day in our life. Man, that's good. Uh, and you guys, you guys do such important work, both administratively and in care of the church. I know the bylaws were just a big thing in our church here, redoing that. And so, uh, hopefully, those pass. This podcast is airing <laughs> after that. So, uh, hopefully, that all went away. All went you know, very smoothly, but you guys do great work from that. But also, like you said, pastoral care, caring for us as a staff. I know this has been a part of several churches in my day. This is one of the churches where I've felt uh, the most loved by leadership of our church. So I just want to say, I appreciate you and I appreciate all the good work that our elders do. I know it benefits our congregation as a whole. And I'm glad to hear that. And uh, yeah. I apologize, but really quick, because yeah, yeah. there's one point I forgot to make. Is, oh, you're all good. So in a lot of churches, the function most people either the eldership itself, or people just assume it's, it's all business related right. and administrative. And while that's important, and that's one of the pieces in, that, that we do, but making sure again, we are first and foremost, we should be the spiritual leaders of the church. Yeah. Um, so once a month we meet and take care of the, the business aspect, but at any point we start, we begin and end and we have prayer in the middle. Um, we had, we had a meeting recently where I think at different points, we just paused two or three times during the meeting just to pray over something specific. Mm. Um, but doing that, but making sure that we're performing the business of the church, but we also have started and started again last year in meeting, um, an extra night each month, um, to make sure that we're growing spiritually, that we are encouraging and challenging one another, that we're, we're growing deeper in our, uh, in our theology and understanding of the word and walking through that together so that we uh, continue to grow in our, in our spiritual maturity and our wisdom and not just seeming to be, okay, are we making good business decisions? Yeah. So uh, we try and provide a good balance there. Hopefully uh, the Lord is, is pleased at the end of the day and says, well done, thou good and faithful servants. But yeah. uh, that is our goal. I love it. Uh, so as we kind of continue forward 
into the into the meat of our podcast today. Uh, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, which for a lot of Christians, the Holy Spirit could come across at times as the redheaded stepchild who you just don't want to talk about, right? Like you, it's kind of like maybe you're afraid of it. You're not quite sure or understand what it is or what it does. So before we get into what it does in the church today, I want to go back to what it did at the beginning and the birth of the church. What was the role of the Holy Spirit during the birth of the church? It's a good question. And first and foremost, I would say, because talking about a lot of people may not know how to view the Holy Spirit. What exactly does that look like? And knowing, you know, growing up being being taught about the Trinity and knowing that we had the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We had the three in one, um, God in in three persons. Um, But too often it's we focus a lot on the Father and on yeah. the Son, on Jesus. And the Holy Spirit kind of gets a, a backseat role and at times is even looked at more of as a, um, as a force instead of a, a separate person mm-hmm. having his own identity. Um, and that's something we need to embrace. And uh, Francis Chan uh, wrote a really good book, um, and I'm not getting any royalties from this, but it's just one that really... Uh, really drove me years ago, and I was yeah. actually thinking I need to reread that again and talking about this, but it's called Forgotten God. But talking about who the Holy Spirit is, what we see in Scripture, and understanding that we need to to engage with Him and, and give Him the, the credit He is due, and also know that as He is indwelling in us, that we need to lean into that. So in saying that, then when we see uh, with the growth of the church, I mean, we see right away. So uh, you'd mentioned in a previous episode talking yeah. about the Pentecost. And so we, we see the Holy Spirit coming down um, on the apostles. And then we see uh, just that amazing day where thousands of people are, are drawn and repent and be baptized and receiving yeah. the Holy Spirit and knowing that he provides the impetus. Um, there was a, a quote that I liked here um, from a, another book that I've been reading called Real Life Theology. Um, that says, and I have, oh, there it is. Um, and it, it says, the spirit of God is the creative power and life-giving essence of God. And I really like mm-hmm. the, the concept of that as we understand what it looks like um, through the, the birth and growth of the church. The yeah. apostles were being powered by, by the Holy Spirit. Um, we see reference to, he was there to ensure that they were, um, they were reminded of in preaching the truth of the gospel. Mm. Um, that, that's a part of his, his work is making sure that what is being stated and put forth is they uh, first spread it through all of the dispersed Jews, but ultimately going out to the Gentiles. Yeah. And we see the, the church growing, that they are preaching the truth as Jesus himself brought, and the Holy Spirit is that reminder. Um, so it's just a, a powerful force. The church would not have grown without the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We, we see Jesus reference that if I don't come, then the comforter cannot come and him referencing the importance of that happening. And then we see that being played out at the beginning of Acts yeah. as, as the apostles start going and, and growing what ultimately becomes the church. Man, that is, that is so, so good. Can you read that real life theology quote one more time? Sure. Cause I want to make sure people hear that. Definitely. The Spirit of God is the creative power and life-giving essence of God. So wow. He is the yeah He is God dwelling within us. Mm. Uh, and if we don't embrace that and lean into Him and follow His leading, which I know we'll talk to, then yeah. we cannot truly be fruitful Christ followers. But wow, yeah. man, that is so so good. Kind of continuing down this path, we have an understanding of how the Holy Spirit played a role within the birth of the church. But what role does the Holy Spirit play within the church today? We see a continuation of what yeah. we saw in the, in the birth, obviously. But uh, we need to understand also that we can't look at that as, as we might with others. Like the tendency of, well, okay, he was the Holy Spirit, sure. Maybe he was empowering the, the apostles. And right. you know, we saw them continuing to do through the, the power of the Spirit and and then, then being direct disciples of Jesus, of continuing with signs and wonders and being able to speak in tongues and doing all those things. Um, but just because he was that primary driving force there, and we're like, well, that was needed back then. It's still true today. We still need to lean into that. We need to embrace the fact that uh, the, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Uh, he is the one that gives us wisdom. He is the one that we pray for it, that gives us greater understanding mm. uh, of the scriptures as we spend time in it. Um, when we talk about spiritual gifts, yeah. um, those come through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and an outpouring of His presence in our life in a variety of ways. We talk about the, the fruits of the Spirit from um, Galatians 6. Yeah. Um, and 
you know, but understanding too, it was interesting, I heard a quote about that. And as we see this within the church, that the evidence of the Holy Spirit in our life and our leaning into him, when we mm-hmm. talk about the fruits of the Spirit, those are just evidence of our um, leaning into the Spirit. Yeah. They're not things that we do. They're, it's evidence of the fruitfulness that is occurring because we are allowing the Holy Spirit to transform our lives. Yeah. Wow, that is awesome. So for the believer today who wants to experience the Holy Spirit, which sounds weird to say, right? Uh, but we believe the Holy Spirit is alive, it's active, it's indwelling with all believers. What, what is their next step? For the person who's like, all right, I hear this thing. There's, there's this spirit of God that wants to move in me, give me gifts, and empower me to do his work. What's my next step to experience that? Well, I will give what some people that might listen to this and think, oh, that's the churchy answer. That's cliche. Yeah. But it's because it's true. The, the two primary things that we can do to experience the, the Holy Spirit and step into that is spending Time in prayer and time in the word. Mm. The more we do that, the more we align with who he has called to us in our life that kind of creates a, 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 a door that's, that's yeah. more wide open for the spirit to work in us and through us as we spend time in that, to continue to breathe that life and encourage us and push us forward with that knowledge that we have. Um, there was a, a quote from, so talking about Forgotten God yeah. uh, by Francis Chan. Uh, there was... Uh, something I liked here too is so as we talk about that and understanding that it just takes time Mm. you know we need to develop those spiritual habits and and get into those things but knowing in order to um, to experience the spirit we have to spend more time in those things if we say it's important we should do it and Francis Chan said um, even in, in thinking about what it would look like in our life. He said, I don't want my life to be explainable without the Holy Spirit. Mm. I want people to look at my life and know that I couldn't be doing this by my own power. Um, he said at a different point too, but I liked how this goes too. If it's true that the Spirit of God dwells in us and that our bodies are the Holy Spirit's temple, which is what we're told, uh, I feel like that might be in Hebrews, but um, then shouldn't there be a huge difference between the person who has the Spirit of God living inside of them or inside of him or her and the person who does not, yeah, um, it, it, it should be evident, but we have to lean into it. We have to commit that time and try and build into it to make mm. that connection with the Holy Spirit and do so intentionally um, and to treat him as a, a he, is, he is here within us and trying to support and encourage us. And we just need to, to be willing to recognize that and say, lead me, guide me. Yeah. I, I want to be a partner, but I, you know, I, I need you to be the, the leading partner in this. Man, that is, that is so, so good. Kind of kind of piggyback off of that. The thing I love that you said is that it's, it's prolonged time in God's word and in prayer. And I think so often in our world today, we're looking for the quote unquote secret, the, the thing that's going to like really like, you know, what's the thing I don't know that everybody else knows that is the reason they're experiencing X, Y, or Z thing. But it really is just the fundamental basic spend time in God's word and in prayer and the Holy Spirit will begin to move. Uh, I know that's true in my life. Uh, I'm one of those people who uh, I share this openly. I struggle with anxiety. It's probably one of the biggest things that I struggle with on a, on a week to week basis. And I love that the Holy Spirit, and you referred to it earlier, is often referred to as a comforter, hmm. right? Because scripture mm-hmm. says if we, if we rely on the Holy Spirit, we will have this peace that goes beyond all understanding that can only come from having the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us. And so I know uh, even on my most anxious days, it's, it's the moments where I pause and I go to God in prayer and I ask for His Holy Spirit to fill me that I can begin to find that peace, that I can begin to find that sense of calm to wash over me. And it's the Holy Spirit playing an active role in my life. And so with that, how have you seen the Holy Spirit play an active role in your life? Well, first and foremost, because as we talk about that and thinking about, you know, the references we see to the spirit of being comforter, yeah. being the helper. I, that was actually, I think I might have said earlier with the comforter, we know he's referenced in a certain part, but Jesus saying, so the helper can come mm. or the guide. But um, that, that churchy answer that I gave about spending more time in the prayer and the word, um, I say that because it's the truth, not only because the Bible told us, but because I've experienced that. Yeah. So knowing as I've grown older, 
and hopefully more mature uh, in my walk and in, in life. Um, that's truly made a difference. The more time I carve out and set aside and am and, and consistent in that time, I see that experience. Mm. Uh, I, I feel the Holy Spirit's presence. I feel his, his guiding more often. But in, in, in talking about what does it look like to experience it, um, I would, I would view it in a, in a couple of different ways. I think um, kind of in, in that reference to developing those spiritual habits to provide more of yeah. a connectivity to it. I think there's, there's long-term understanding and seeing how he has guided me and been that helper through my life. So I have long-term experience in seeing how he's played into my life and seeing how um, God has led me through certain situations because yeah. he was preparing me for something here. Uh, but I also see it in the short term. Um, and I think what, you know, sometimes people just say, oh, my conscience, or I just had a gut feeling or whatever. The Holy Spirit prompts us. If we are uh, Christ followers, if, if the Holy Spirit lives within us because we have devoted our lives and committed our lives to Jesus, um, I truly believe he is pushing you in certain situations to do things. Uh, and a lot of times, I think more often it might be, uh, something that's recognizable when you can't get a thought out of your head, even though it scares the crap out of you, um, <laughs> because he wants us to to step out and yeah. be uncomfortable and challenge us. And and I I say that in some smaller ways. I've seen it played out in driving down the road, and and I've had moments where you know we we've probably all been there at times where it looks like somebody's out of gas or somebody's having a problem, yeah. and you might have a little bit of guilt and oh I should really. I should probably stop and see if they need help, but somebody else will probably get it. I, I've got some place to go that might be important. Um, there have been other times where it has been so strong. I can recall two times in my life yeah. where it was so strong. Like it, it was like a punch in the face when I drove by, like I need to do something to where I couldn't let it go. And I got off one time I was on the highway, I got off and turned around and, and circled back to go. Yeah. Cause I felt like the Holy spirit wanted me to be in there in that situation. Um, so we have those guidings if we're willing to listen to it. I also the, the biggest one that I attribute is in part of my growth as a Christ follower and just to, to mature in my life was being pushed to go to Haiti, saying yes to go to, to Haiti, going outside of something that was totally uncomfortable for me for a variety of reasons. And just the experience, even though I got, I got sick on the trip there. So normally that would be a, a total turnoff and like, okay, yeah. I'm not coming back because yeah, it, it did not go well on the plane ride. And then we had a four hour bus ride afterwards. Um, and yet, I went back a few years later just because of the, the power and how God used that to work in my life. And I know that was the Holy Spirit's prompting. So yeah. uh, there are specific evidence uh, and experiences in my life where I can see the Holy Spirit working in me. It's, are we willing to recognize that and, and watch for it? Yeah. Um, sometimes we're intentionally trying to ignore that, but are you being mindful of his working in our life? Mm. Well, Chad, I want to say thank you for being on the podcast today. I think the, the real tangible next step for anybody in this conversation is prolonged time in God's word and prolonged time in prayer so they can experience the Holy Spirit. So once again, thank you, brother, for being on. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, if you enjoyed this, uh, please join us next week. We're going to continue this conversation through the book of Acts.